We are live. Welcome all to the Ars Electronica Festival 2020. We are live broadcasting from the old observatory in the city center of Leiden in the Netherlands. My name is Sanne Gammeren and I am the coordinator of events, education and exhibitions in the old observatory. And behind the scenes, we have Kira taking care of technical aspects and Maria taking care of our social media feed. We have a fantastic program for you for today. And of course, we would like to invite you all to ask us questions during the talks. Uh, there is some delay between YouTube and the platform we are broadcasting uh, from, uh, but we will try our best to cover all questions you have. Uh, and you can leave questions and comments in the section, in the comment section in YouTube. Uh, and we can already do a try out. So for instance, we are very curious where people are watching from. If you feel like it, please share with you uh, your country, your place, or your city you're watching from. Uh, we're looking forward to see where you are tuning in from. And then, of course, the event for today. So the event of today and the other three days to come are organized under the heading of Ars Electronica. Ars Electronica Festival is a festival for art, technology, and society, normally taking place in Linz, Austria. But of course, due to COVID-19, uh, they decided to ask their partners to organize events during the festival. And this is how our four day event schedule came to be. Today, we will present to you several talks from both, art, uh, both from artistic side, scientific and philosophical sides. Uh, we invited several artists, photographers, astronomers, curators and philosophers to give presentations today. In the meantime, I would like to check uh, if we have some answers already from the public, um, are there some uh, comments yet in YouTube? Um, I think not yet. So maybe later on, please, if you feel like it, uh, give some comments where you're looking from. Oh, and there's, oh, there's already some people watching from Leiden. So that's good, that's close by. Um, so if you feel like it, please add a comment. So um, now, uh, with um, after this introduction, this brief introduction, uh, I would like to already uh, go forward to the first presentation. Um, the first speakers of today. Nowadays, we can't really imagine our society to function without the use of electronic devices. Photogra photographers Andrew Phelps and Paul Krenzler went even further than that. They traveled to Green Bank, West Virginia, and captured the unique mixture of people living there. For instance, the rural population of a provincial town, the highly specialized scientists from the research facility there, and the electro electrosensitive civilization refugees. Their work is uh, at the moment presented in our visitor center, um, and you will be able to see the exhibition on Sunday if you, um, if you visit us. Uh, but for the presentation, I would first like to start with a teaser. You know, the observatory's been here all my life. The observatory come in in the late 50s, early 60s. They come in and bought the land up. You know, I was just young then. Since coming here, I, there's a lot, it has opened up a lot of scientific activity because obviously a big telescope. But my passion has been since back even in graduate school is to study how galaxies form. When they have a cell phone or an iPad and it has wireless communications, where is that radiation going? Personally, I think there is something out there. We are just too small in the universe to be the only people around. I mean, if you look at the different galaxies around, there has to be something out there somewhere. Thank you very much. This is the teaser for the exhibition and the uh, artistic, artistic program. And I would like to give the floor to photographers Andrew Phelps and Paul Krenzler. Welcome, Andrew and Paul. Hi. Hi, Hi Sona. Hi. 
How are you doing? Good. Wish we were there, but we can't, so we're sitting here. Paul is yeah. at least in Linz. He's at least down the street from Ars Electronica. But. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so can you maybe explain us why this area intrigued you in the first place? Why here? Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with the pictures, okay? Of course, go ahead. Project those up because we've kind of, um, of course, our motivation for going there is a big part of the project. And um, I'm going to share the screen now. Am I full screen? I think so. Yeah. Yes, it looks all great. Good. Um, okay, the our book entitled The Drake Equation um, was published a couple of years ago, actually, by the Fountain Publishing House in Berlin. Um, Paul and I are both photographers and old friends. And for several years, we were looking for a project that we could do together. And we both have an, an interest in photography as storytelling, but we knew we wanted to travel to some exotic place that was new for us. And our book entitled The Drake Equation, I know we have probably a lot of scientists in the audience. Um, I'm not at all a scientist, I'm a photographer, so it's quite difficult, I think, for any average person to explain what the Drake equation actually is. But in, in a few simple words, it's an, it's an equation that tries to predict the possibility of finding life in outer space. And each one of these elements of the equation is defined by, for example, here, the average rate of star formations in the galaxy or the fraction of those planets that actually develop life, etc. So you can see it's a very fragile calculation. Only any one of these aspects could possibly be zero, and in which case there won't be any life out there. Of course, we know that all of them are at least one because we're here on Earth. So the, the Drake equation is this kind of abstract attempt to, to uh, guess the probability of life uh, beyond Earth. And this is a portrait that we found of Frank Drake, who wrote this equation um, sort of spontaneously in 1961 when he was preparing a lecture for the um, first meeting of the SETI Foundation. And based on his uh, theories and his equation, the National Radio Quiet Zone was established in Green Bank, West Virginia. Um, Here's a little map to sort of orientate where it is. Paul's going to tell us a little bit about why they chose this place. And this is the first picture of kind of the valley where Green Bank is. Yeah. Yeah. Like Andrew said, uh, Frank Drake was setting up his equation in 1961. And that's uh, when, when everything started. We, we actually photographed and, and saw Frank Drake's first uh, radio telescope, which is like just a small piece of, of metal. Uh, um, uh, looking really like a sculpture, um, and and uh, since uh, 1961, um, they started to 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 look for for a place where they could uh, build a huge site and huge uh, telescopes, radio telescopes. I mean, we are talking uh, about like I think the GBT is the the biggest uh, moving uh, construction worldwide. Yeah, because it's, it can turn like 36 degrees. Um, so why did they pick this place? Um, they were searching for a place where they were, uh, would not be disturbed. Um, and um, they were also looking for a place that would uh, stay that quiet. Um, so that place, uh, Green Bank Valley in Pocahontas County, which is in West Virginia, which is in the Appalachians, is really surrounded by hills and mountains. Um, still, it's just five hours away from Washington, D.C., so comparable close. Uh, and even in the 60s, 70s, when they started to work there, um, there was just some coal mining and some timber industry. But uh, they, they made some research and they were um, foreseeing that um, this industry actually doesn't have a future and would go down. And that's also what happened. Um, the area is now even less populated um, than it was in the 60s and 70s, which is great for the telescopes because they, uh, what, the one thing that they uh, don't want is um, um, 
interference by electromagnetic waves. So any industry, um, um, anything um, strong electromagnetic waves would uh, disturb the radio telescopes. And they, so they, they really could set up a huge national radio quiet zone. So they could really forbid by law, um, like um, strong uh, emitting, um, like industries that would uh, emit uh, radio waves. To, to get a scale, this, this yeah. is what they call the GBT, the Green Bank Telescope. Uh, the locals call it the great big thing but it's this uh, big telescope. And this is an, an image that we had special permission of me actually standing, not even in the middle of it. Paul mm -hmm. is actually standing in the middle of it to photograph. So um, these are massive structures that are incredibly sensitive and they're so sensitive, they're, 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 they're uh, gathering electromagnetic waves coming from distant corners of the, of the mm -hmm. universe. And they're, they're translating these uh, radio waves into data that they use to process um, for science. That was one of the aspects why we were attracted to go there was this fascination with kind of the science behind it. Um, while we were there, we came in contact with a group of people who call themselves electromagnetic hypersensitives who are moving there simply because of the fact that there is no technology in the area, specifically no Wi-Fi. In the 60s when they built this, Radio free simply meant no television or radio, but now it means you can actually live without Wi-Fi. Um, as Paul said, unfortunately, there's a big um, uh, problem with poverty there because there's no industry. If you're not working for the telescopes, there's really nothing there for you to do. Um, and the third aspect that really interested us that we're going to dive into now is the, is the local scene. They, they call themselves hillbillies, not in a derogatory way. That's almost a, a friendly way now. And these are families that have lived on their, far, their families' uh, farmhouses for, for generations. And they still live off of the land. Uh, hunting is still one of the biggest um, sources of protein for the locals who live there. So that was our fascination to go there, was this coming together of these three um, interesting groups of people, astrophysicists from all over the world, the locals who, who still live a very hunting and rural lifestyle combined with these, this new generation of electromagnetic hypersensitives, of people who are moving there. Um, so I'm going to dive into kind of the book. And as we flip through it, Paul and I are going to talk about um, certain aspects maybe paul if you want to talk about how many trips we went and yeah um, yeah like i mean we were we were doing our first research i think in 2013 like somewhere online we we found an article about this place and and started to follow it and to research it and uh but uh in, until like 2015 when we just sat into a plane and, and flew there. I mean, we, we were in contact with the press uh, manager, their press officer there, and they were, it sounded all very interesting and they sounded very welcoming, but really, really did not know what to expect there really. Yeah. But finally they were very welcoming and the organization uh, is very open to the public. Um, um, and um, so finally we, we did two trips there um, one in, in spring 2015 and one in autumn 2015. And uh, yeah, well, um, we, we were really overwhelmed by, by, by the area. It's a very special place. A lot of things come together there. Like on the one hand, you have like this best scientists, uh, radio astro uh, astronomists uh, from all over the world working there. And right next to it, uh, you would have bear hunters. And I mean, what's also interesting for us as, as we, we are also, we have been photographic artists and um, we were all, always interested in like this social uh, issues as well, um, that the state or the government just decides that a huge area is um, like um, excluded from technical progress because they want to to um, proceed with uh, highly advanced technical research there. Mm -hmm. So this, there is this place which is highly advanced and all the surroundings is excluded from, uh, from um, 
progress so it's it's, it's very strange yeah, it's, it's that kind of almost um contradictory aspect yeah. kind of mm -hmm. a challenge um it was also important to say because you have to imagine because the telescopes are so sensitive um we're not allowed to photograph digitally there i mean mm -hmm. paul and i both come from old school analog photography but in the last few years everything has gone digital well you get there you can't have anything electronic um they were very open about letting us go wherever we wanted. They said, you can go wherever you want, just don't climb on anything and don't have anything electronic with you. So when you're there close to the telescopes, you can't use a light meter, you can't use a digital camera, you can't use a flash. So we were kind of forced to make analog photography again. Um, so it, basically, if you think about um, the sensitivity, kind of like a spiral, anytime you're very close to the scopes, you can't have anything electronic. But as you get three or four kilometers away, you can start to have small electronics. Mm -hmm. So anytime you see a photograph where there's actually a telescope in the image, then it's made analog. Mm -hmm. We did have digital cameras with us as we got farther away. Mm -hmm. um, um, like Andrew, was, one, one fun fact was, I want to mention this, for example, in the control room of the, of the uh, um, telescope, they had a kitchen with a microwave, but the microwave was in a Faraday cage. Yeah. So to operate the microwave, first you would have to close the Faraday cage. Um, so uh, no electromagnetic waves would like interfere with the scope. Yeah. So after being there for just a couple of days, we soon met this woman who Paul will talk a little bit about. She is kind of the, 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 um, sort of, the, I guess you could say, the first self-proclaimed electromagnetic hypersensitive to discover this area. Yeah. Her name is Diane, and she, she, she moved there from Iowa. And actually, she, she is a scientist herself, uh, she and her husband. And, um, well, they, um, um, they, they blame the, the electro, uh, electro smog that uh, increased in, in the last years. Um, to, to be the reason for several health issues they, they have. And um, actually we as artists, we did not really make our opinion about this. Yeah, we accept it and we take it serious. And, um, and also the, the things that, that she explained to us sounded serious. And, um, and there were people from all over, especially North America coming there either um, to stay there for a couple uh, of months uh, of months to recover or even to, to really move there uh, from, from um, um, places uh, from, from big cities to just yeah, to stay there. And, and like in the cabin, as we see on this picture, this would be a cabin that Diane organizes for she calls them refugees for, for people who flee from electromagnetic um, um, electrum smog. Right. And actually that girl, um, she, I mean, we worried, were a little bit worried about her because she went, came there with her father and grandmother who uh, claimed to be uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, high, high sensitive. And we thought, okay, this, this girl is a little bit lost there in, in the woods, a little bit in, in the middle of nowhere, right? Yeah. Um, and actually when we asked the scientists at the scope, if they believe that, uh, if they believe in electromagnetic hypersensitivity, they actually said, um, yeah, it could be, you know, it could be that, well, that uh, some people are somehow allergic to it and maybe in a couple of years, um, it, it will be able to prove. So there was no one of these scientists uh, who claimed that he uh, is hypersensitive himself, but there was no one who said that it's impossible. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew Paul, can you maybe tell us a little bit about how these different uh, groups uh, how they respond to each other? Do they live peacefully side to side or do they have certain opinions on the other groups? 
Actually, I think like the hypersensitives, they love the telescopes and they really live peacefully side by side because if they want to go online, for example, they can go to the library of the telescope where they have a computer with a landline connection, landline internet connection, or they can go and have lunch there because there's one of the very few places where you can eat out and things like that. And interesting thing is that many of the hypersensitives are scientists or highly educated people themselves. And then on the other hand, there are the hunters and the locals. And many of them um, are quite like live from the land and live more or less like their ancestor lived uh, like 200 years ago, right, Andrew? Like from yeah, the yeah. land and from the hunting? Like th uh, this gentleman right here, uh, his name is Chief Warner. Um, he, he claimed to us that he lives on the same house that his ancestors actually uh, staked out and defended from uh, Native American Indians, you know, 250 years ago. So these are people who have been here for a long, long time and have never, have never had an internet connection or a cell phone. So for them, the, facts that the, the fact that the telescopes moved in didn't really change anything. And they seem to be uh, very much open to anybody kind of living their life the way they want to, but they get a little frustrated when certain groups of the hypersensitives move in and want to start changing things. That they come to town and say, you know, the library, the lights are a little too bright. Can we, can we change out the neon lights to some other lights? Or, um, and the locals think, okay, you know, you're welcome to come here and live, but uh, we don't want you to sort of start changing the town too much. We had a fantastic afternoon with um, Chief and his family, and they actually took us bear hunting. And it was maybe of the entire process, for me, the most uh, magical day because we spent the morning from sunrise till the afternoon hunting a bear. We actually ran a bear up a tree. Thankfully, they didn't shoot it. I think they would have shot it maybe if we asked them to, but we didn't need them to shoot it. We were more interested in the, in the hunt. And that afternoon, then we actually made those pictures where I was walking inside the great big telescope. So it really in one day, we were able to experience these, these two worlds that, that live within a kilometer or two of each other, but only very briefly have any exchange with each other. Um, the, like I mentioned before, the sheriff told us that for a lot of the local families that, that hunting is their, their main source of protein and meat. Um, there's, there, you have to drive a long way to get to a big grocery store. So in the hunting season, they load up on meat, fill their freezers with um, um, as much game as they can. And possibly because of the telescopes, there's an abundance of wildlife. They have too many bears, for example. Um, an average bear has one or two bear cubs, but there they have bears that'll have three cubs, for example. And some people say it's because there's no Wi-Fi and it's a much more healthy place to live. The hunters think it's just because there aren't any predators around. Um, so in bear, during bear season, this, this one family and his group of friends, for example, will kill up to 30 bear, which is, is for us seems crazy, but for them, it's such a part of the lifestyle. So this, um, uh, as a photographer, being from the outside and being able to just drop in there for a couple months at a time, and literally walk between these, these different ideologies and these different ways of thinking about the landscape is just kind of a, it's, it's kind of a, a, a gift. It's like almost everywhere you turn, there's, there's something sort of placed on the table for you to talk about. Um, yeah, this, um, I don't know, Paul, you want to talk about Wayne, one of the locals we befriended who... Um, yeah, well, Wayne had a, had a very a small... Uh, um, um, breakfast store and the grocery store and um, I think he, he lived there all, all his life mm -hmm. and um, we we the first couple of nights we lived in a in a in an old uh, cabin next to to his shop and that was a very good place for us to get in touch with the locals mm -hmm. uh, who were very open actually yeah and invited us and and everything I mean and especially for me as a European it was even more interesting and and actually to be honest it i, I have been in the in the in the states uh, uh many times before but never that far out in the wildness and that's like when i first somehow understood what the what like the americans mean with the land of the free and and, and things like that
Tell yeah. a little bit about this picture, Paul, because it's interesting why it's lit like this. This is the only like bar or restaurant. Yeah, they it, they, it's lit like that. I think it's with LED lights, and they had had um, 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 other lights before, but they changed it as um, electromagnetic hypersensitives uh, asked them if they could change the lights because um, they would also like to to come into this bar. Yeah, and the, the owner of the bar told us she doesn't believe in any of the hypersensitivity, but she said, if I don't change the lights, then I lose like half of the customers of out of yeah. town. So you walk into this um, little roadside bar and it kind of feels like a disco. Mm. So this, uh, the, this bar is one of the few places where these different communities mingle. Yeah, yeah. It's a place, the one place in town where there's a pool table and um, yeah, it, when we would go there, you would, we would see everybody. You have to imagine after being several weeks there, we kind of knew everybody, or at least it felt like we knew everybody. So, um, and we became sort of the, like the red thread between a lot of people, people who would normally have no contact with each other. Um, they would say, Oh, Paul and Andrew visited me. Oh, they were at my place too. And, um, we became sort of the, uh, the, um, the go between, I think between a lot of people. Did it also result in interesting discussions or do these people go into discussion with each other? Um, no, but we heard a lot of, you know, people complaining about other people. Oh, you know, you, sh you shouldn't spend too much time with them because they did I mean, it. What we, what we didn't really mention today really is that um, when they founded it, um, they decided that a certain um, uh, amount of time of the, of the scopes uh, is dedicated to the search of extraterrestrial life. And this is still the case. So the scopes uh, operate like 24-7 uh, and a certain uh, amount of their- Manpower and money. Research uh, uh, for extraterrestrial uh, life. And actually, I think um, Hawkins uh, a couple of years, years ago said that now is the the, the, um, the chances yeah. to actually find extraterrestrial ter life, wh whatever it may look like, um, um, have never been as high as now, right? Yeah. And that was that was kind of a question we found interesting to ask anybody, whoever they were, wherever they yeah. were, is if they thought there would be life in outer space. And of course, we got a lot of different answers. Um, maybe. Um, because the, the whole topic is, is art and science. I want to talk a little bit about our way of working because we made this book and a lot of people who are interested in the science would comment and say, why there's no captions under the pictures. Why don't you write underneath, you know, mm -hmm. what this telescope is, or why don't you write down that this gentleman, for example, is, is a very famous uh, astrophysicist and um, professor and doctor who now lives there and studies. And if both of us are of the feeling that we don't want to make something photojournalistic, we want to make something a little more open. I say the word poetic, but that's often mistaken. We want to make something a little more um, um, abstract where the viewer kind of puts different stories together. For example, this man sort of staring up into space next mm -hmm. to this still life. Mm -hmm. These are made days apart in, in completely different context. I mean, we, won't even, we never even really say what this one is as an abstract piece. But um, combining it with a picture of, um, you know, the pastor from the local church and his family, the viewer can make different associations about the feeling of what this place might be about, which we think is more interesting than, than giving it, you know, each image a title and a caption and saying, you know, January 13th, um, Pastor Phillips and his family standing in front of the Church of God. That just seems I mean, like actually, the end. We, we tried to photograph the invisible, right? That's the challenge. We're, we were there trying to photograph something that you can't see. And that's, that's um, a difficult endeavor as a photographer. Because everybody is there because of something you can't see. The telescopes are there trying to collect electromagnetic waves from space. The hypersensitives are there because they're trying to flee from, from Wi-Fi. You can't photograph that. So all you can do is, is, is collect stories and little details. And by combining portraits and still lives and landscapes, um, try and tell the story of the place. Are we doing on time? Yeah. Hey, you're still doing great. <laughs> okay. Um, 
a question we got a lot after coming back is people would ask us, um, well, did you feel any better when you were there? How did it feel to be in a, in a radio free zone for a couple months? And um, I, I mean, I think I can answer for Paul as well. I didn't feel uh, physically any different, but it was mentally really nice not to have a phone for weeks at a time. I mean, to, it, it's literally turned off and in the suitcase because it, it doesn't, it's kind of, it's useless there. And I think that, that, that reminder to like, just shut down and turn things off uh, felt good. Especially if you are there to, to, to do our work, which uh, is, is also like meeting new people, yeah? And, and finding new places, yeah? So. Because you, you just mentioned meeting people. It was, it's interesting when you go to a place like that, you realize how dependent we've become on being able to reach anybody anytime. For example, we would make an appointment to, we would meet somebody like say in the bar the night before. And um, this is just an example. Uh, yeah, why don't you come over tomorrow and um, you can take some pictures. So you go there, but they have a note on the door said, oh, sorry, I couldn't be here. Um, how about tomorrow? And um, so you go there the next day and, and, and coordinating things is, is, is tricky. But then when you do set up a time and say, okay, we're going to meet tomorrow at two o'clock, then you really made a point of being there at two o'clock because you, you couldn't just at the last minute send a text and say, oh, you know, I'm running late, let's, let's change it. So and, uh, the two of you, you have uh, all different kinds of projects uh, you get into. Do you see major differences between this kind of science art projects and the other projects you do? Um, yeah, I think um, the, the, the approach to this is different because there were two of us. This is the first time we've ever done a project where we both, on every single picture, is, is Kranzler Phelps. And that's difficult as an artist when we're used to doing our own projects. It's difficult to like throw everything on the table like that and say, I'm giving up my, my own um, copyright. So as far as our way of working, that was, that was new. Um, the art and science part, I think what really attracts us to this project is that we're both, even though we don't understand it, we're absolutely fascinated by the, the science behind it. And I think this place, at least for me, so much of the science that there is really analog. Um, even though these, these scopes, they feel like very high tech and modern, it's still just a dish that's collecting radiation and focusing it up to a small disc. And uh, a lot of the, the scientists need something there, then a guy goes out and, and builds it in a field out of, out, of, out of plastic and wire. So I think it was one of, a, it's kind of a scientific field that I feel comfortable kind of taking on because I don't really understand it, but I understand that kind of analog process of, of like hands-on and um, like this, this, you know, this beautiful drawing here made by an architect and on the right is a is really kind of a hand built uh, telescope receiver that's that's you know simply standing out in a field. I'm kind of rambling, but Paul, you can jump in. Yeah, I mean there were there were many of those weird uh, construction on the side, right? It was like prototypes of of uh, radio telescopes, actually. Yeah, mm. and and students would come and 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 build. Uh, uh, on a pro uh, walk on a prototype for weeks, and uh, yeah, this actually is uh, this picture was taken in the cabin of a so-called uh, refugee, uh, a woman who lived really in the woods, really off the grid, without electricity, without running water. And her 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 house is built exactly the width of a of a semi truck, so she could put it on the back of a truck if she ever had to move it. Yeah. And what do you guys think uh, our society can learn from how they do things there? Hmm. Yeah. Um, Maybe in regard of the use of electronic devices, of course. But uh, for instance, uh, that community has been isolated 
for quite a long time. And now in these times, in those these pandemic times, maybe there are some lessons to learn from that community. Possibly. I, I, I often felt when I was there, I thought, I, I don't think I don't think I could live here in this lifestyle. But if, if the world was ending, I would, I would that would probably feel the safest there. I had a feeling like the people there um, could um, could solve kind of any problem that that came up, whether it be you know, a physical problem to solve or um, uh, sort of social structures. It, they seem to be um, so dependent on their own resources. Um, Simply the fact that you you have to drive for a couple hours to get to a really big supermarket, so there's a lot of like um, farming that they live off of. So I think this idea of being um, self-contained and self-efficient was definitely impressive. But you also have to keep in mind it's it's not typical of a small American town because the telescopes are there. I mean, there's a massive. Um, uh, government structure that's there that employs a lot of people that a lot of the locals work there as you know mechanics or technicians or they work in the in the restaurant so there's a there's only a small fraction of the people employed there that are actually astrophysicists so it's it's hard to compare it to like an average you know small town paul and what 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 i thought found interesting is what one of the scientists said that this uh the National Radio Quiet Zone really is like unique in the world because there are very few places that are comparable uh, with, with low low noise. With, with uh, he said, which he mean what he means is um, with um, that little uh, electromagnetic interference. Which I was wondering about that. I thought in the middle of the desert uh, somewhere it it would be you know uh, even easier to to um, be cut off uh, electromagnetic fields, but um, no, um, there in the this special valley surrounded by mountains in combination with the quiet zone, it, it really is a very special place. Yeah. And for example, this guy that we whom we saw on this image, he is one of the technicians. He drives around in a special equipped truck and searches for. Um, um, sources uh, that disturb the, the the telescopes. Yeah, he would track down the source, and for example, he would he would uh, somehow track down the source to a uh, a trailer park and uh, actually find out that those people use Wi-Fi in the trailer, even though they are not allowed to. They are only allowed to use landline. So he asks them um, kindly to 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 switch it off. Or when we were uh, uh, riding with his truck with him, um, I think he found that there was a, some cable from from a cable TV or something was not um, was not um, mounted properly. Mounted yeah. Properly, yeah, yeah. And I think that's kind of the way we work photographically. Right here, he's actually just trying to block the sun so he can check a power line. But then in the context of this work, it's almost like he's protecting himself from some kind of radiation or something coming from space. So it becomes of like a metaphor for something that, that, that it's not. And I want to, because we're getting kind of towards the end. So I want to come back to the point that a lot of people, not a lot of, that's the wrong term. There were people that complained that, oh, I, I want to learn about this place. And in your book, all I can do is get an impression of what it's like to be there. But um, I don't get any um, information about it. So when we put the book together, it was important to have this section in the back that that starts with a, a an aerial photograph from the 1970s, mm -hmm. and in this back section, uh, we've sort of documented all the little aspects that we talk about in the book, and then there's actually text accompanying each image. So you can, if you want, you can read deeper into. The various various aspects that we sort of touch upon. So it was a way of finding a balance of of giving information to the people who are interested in the science and the technology and the hunting and the local scene, but not creating a book that felt like you know reading a, a um, you know a, a a piece of of journalism that felt like it had to have a give give a story or a title under each picture. 
that's the back thank of the you, book. Yeah, thank you so much, Andrew and Paul. Um, of course, um, uh, you all so exhibit your work in our Fister Center. Um, I am happy to announce that uh, from this Sunday on, people will be able to visit our Fister Center again. So we will reopen and uh, your work is still there. Uh, so if you people uh, didn't have enough from this presentation, you can visit us from Sunday on and uh, see uh, the exhibition. But also uh, I think Andrew and Paul will give another talk tomorrow. So we will see the two of you tomorrow again. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much. This was great. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I hope to see you again tomorrow. Sure, we'll be here. Thanks, Anna. Thank uh -huh. you. Um, I would like to move on to the second speaker. And uh, we just talked about the artistic component of astronomy uh, and how to document it. Uh, and now uh, we would like to elaborate a bit more on uh, the scientific aspect. Uh, and we are continuing on the uh, subject of uh, radio astronomy. Uh, and uh, Wendy Williams, she studies the sky by means of radio astronomy in order to map out uh, the intricate interplay between black holes and their host galaxies as they grow and evolve in the universe. Wendy Williams is a postdoc researcher at Leiden University uh, and she will talk about the evolution of radio loud active galactic nuclei. Uh, welcome, Wendy. Hi, Sana. Thanks for, for having me. Thank you. Uh, I think for sure in your uh, presentation, you will be able to explain us what active galactic nuclei are. Yes, I will. <laughs> so the floor is yours. Great. Thank you. Just to check, you can see my screen, okay? Yes, we do. <laughs> Great. So yeah, thanks for, for having me. Um, I'm just going to start straight off with, with this image. Um, I think many of you will have seen it uh, already. It came out last year. It's a very exciting image um, taken, in fact, with the radio telescopes, uh, radio telescopes operating across the whole world uh, in the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, and it is, in fact, the an image of a black hole. Well, actually it's the image of the, the silhouette or the, the shadow of a, a black hole of, of matter that's busy accreting onto a black hole. And it's, this particular source is, is the black hole, the supermassive black hole. So that's a black hole with a mass of millions of times the sun, the, the mass of our own sun. Um, and it lives in the center of the, the galaxy M87. Um, but I just wanna show you what this galaxy looks like. Um, if you zoom out a little bit. So still looking uh, with radio telescopes, uh, this is using a telescope called the Very Long Baseline Array, uh, an array of telescopes, uh, still at radio frequencies. And what you start to see now is not the, the disk around the black hole, but these weird kind of jet shaped structures. Um, so this is a factor of 100 times larger than the little disk here. And you're seeing these, these jet structures. Um, but using different radio telescopes, we can zoom out even further. So this is a factor 10,000 times further uh, larger now that we're looking at. Uh, this is observed with the, the very large array. Um, and you see these, these jets really push out and extend uh, to scales much, much larger than the black hole itself. Um, and then going out even further, another factor of 10 using the LOFAR telescope, which I'll talk a little bit about later on. Uh, we really see these, these jets kind of diffuse out into the medium between, between galaxies. That's a, that's a giveaway. So this is the radio image. If you look at the same part of the sky, um, what you see is, is this here. This is approximately on the same, uh, same scale. Um, what you see is this uh, large uh, galaxy. It's a pretty boring kind of a galaxy. It's a big, massive elliptical galaxy. The interesting thing is even in the optical, you can see a, a slight jet of this, um, the same jet that we see over here. Um, so what we know, we know that there are black holes in other galaxies. We also know that these black holes produce these jets, which give rise to radio emission, which we then observe with radio telescopes. I'll go into a little bit more of that in, in a minute. Um, and they're really fascinating, fascinating objects to, to study. Um, 
This is just another example. It's a very classic example called Perseus A, the radio source. Again, it lives in a massive elliptical galaxy and you can see these large jets stretching out to scales actually much larger than the, the size of the, the galaxies themselves. This big galaxy here actually lives in a, a cluster uh, of other galaxies. Um, galaxies tend to live in, in groups or clusters. Um, so one of the things we don't fully understand is how exactly the black hole produces these jets that then shoot out. Um, but we clearly see evidence of this uh, and we also see the connection with the, the black holes. So uh, before I get on, uh, thank you very much for, for inviting me. As Sana said, I'm Wendy um, and I'm a postdoc at uh, Leiden University here. And really what I, I specialize in is kind of looking for these, these black holes uh, using radio surveys. And then also looking at, at the kind of galaxies that they, they live in. So if you were extremely lucky uh, and lived in a very dark place, perhaps even near, near Green Bank, um, as Andrew and Paul were talking about, some very remote dark place, you'd look up at the night sky and see something like this, um, full of stars, stars everywhere. Also this chain of, of stars down here, which is our own Milky Way galaxy that we live inside and are looking at all the stars in it. One of the problems though, and you can see it in this image, like even here, these are clouds, uh, like rain clouds maybe, uh, and they block out the starlight. The same thing happens in, in our galaxy. There are these clouds, uh, they're not rain clouds, but they're clouds of, of dust um, that blocks out the, the starlight. But if you had eyes that were big enough, um, eyes like this radio telescope in this image here, this is the very large array, um, you would look up and probably see something that looks like this. Um, at first glance, maybe it seems quite similar. There's lots of points all over the place. Um, spoiler alert, those aren't stars. Um, and there's not really this clear like structure of Milky Way, but there's these weird fluffy things, round things. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but if you had even bigger eyes or eyes that operated at even lower rate frequencies, so light with even longer wavelengths, you might even see something that looks like this. Uh, this is actually a real image uh, taken at multiple different frequencies, so they turned it into a colorful image um, taken with the Murchison Widefield Array in Australia. Uh, it looks like this actually. Um, and at these frequencies you can actually see this train across the sky. This is the Milky Way. Uh, you can also see these round little things. I'll come back to these in a minute. And also outside here, you can see all the dots everywhere uh, and these very large sources, very much like the source we saw at the beginning of this presentation, these, these jets coming from, from black holes. So the radio sky is both similar to the optical sky and also very, very different. And one of the, the fundamental reasons why it is so different is because the, the physical processes um, giving rise to the radiation that we see, that we observe, um, are quite different. So many of us are quite familiar, if you take a poker and stick it in a fire, it'll start to get hot and it'll start to glow red. And if you keep it in long enough and the fire is hot enough, it'll then start to glow white, even possibly blue looking. So everything in the universe has some kind of energy, it has some kind of temperature, uh, and because of this, it always radiates um, some energy in what's known as black body radiation. And this radiation has a very specific shape uh, that looks like these curves here. So this is just the brightness as a function of the, the wavelength or the color of the light. Uh, and the hotter something is, the more it'll be to the blue side. And if something is colder, it'll be on the red side. So our sun uh, gives radiation like this, and it actually peaks around here in the kind of yellow greenish region, right where our eyes are evolved to, to look at things. Um, it does actually give up radiation all over the place in the infrared um, and further, but this becomes very, very faint. Uh, so this kind of radiation to see it at radio wavelengths, which are down here, very, very long wavelengths, um, it would be almost impossible to see it. But there are other processes that give off radiation. And one of the most important here um, for the kind of work that I do 
is the radiation that comes from charged particles, so electrons or protons or other kinds of ions um, interacting with magnetic fields. And in particular, when these charged particles are um, going very fast, they're going at speeds close to that of the speed of light, um, they interact with the magnetic fields and give rise to some kind of radiation. Um, this radiation for a single particle uh, would have a characteristic shape, very similar to what we see from uh, thermal radiation, that radiation that comes just because things have a temperature. Um, it's also peaked at a very specific value, but there's never just one electron. There'll be a whole population of electrons. And it turns out that there's a lot more things with lower energies than higher energies. So the sum of many, many of these electrons gives you a shape that looks like this. So essentially, things get brighter as you go to longer wavelengths. So as you get to radio wavelengths, uh, this kind of emission becomes very important. So generally what we're seeing in the radio a lot of the time is to do with um, charged particles interacting with, with magnetic fields. So we can use the radio light to, to trace um, these processes. So with that little physics knowledge behind us, we can look at uh, our map of the sky in the radio again and look at in closer detail what some of these things are, like this, these things here. Uh, what we know when you look at them in, in other wavelengths too, like the X-ray over here, the optical, uh, infrared, and now the radio, these very spherical things. Uh, these are familiarly known as supernova remnants. So when stars are born, they evolve, um, they run out of fuel eventually, and particularly the massive stars that don't live very long, they go through this process quickly, and then they explode in the form of a, a supernova. And this explosion also produces ions and electrons, uh, which are then accelerated in the, the magnetic field. So we see these things shining in, in the radio. So our Milky Way, we see this rain of uh, the, the stream of uh, sort of spherical things uh, along the sky. So we're seeing, I call it star formation. This is actually star death, but it's intricately tied to the formation of stars because the stars have to form before they die. Um, and in fact, we can see entire other galaxies. In the same way in the other image, we saw the, the Milky Way at the radio. Uh, we can also see other galaxies, so face-on galaxies like this one here. This is a little zoom in of a patch of the sky in the radio. Uh, and if you look in detail at this source, you can see the, the spiral shapes even in the radio that very closely match. This is the optical image down here in the lower left. Um, you can see the spiral, you can see the stars themselves in the optical image and the, the radio matches that quite, quite nicely. And this is because the uh, electrons and so on that are accelerated in supernovae sort of propagate out and uh, swim through the rest of the galaxy, even diffusing out to the outer edges of the galaxy beyond even the stars. Um, so we can measure this, uh, this radio light and get some information on how many stars are actually forming in these, these galaxies. But as I started this talk, the other um, major thing we see in this image, actually this is poorly located right at the top here, there's a good example of these two kind of pear-like sources where you see the two lobes um, that if you zoom in on look like this and they often have a bright spot right in the center coinciding with that bright optical galaxy that we see. Uh, these come in a variety of shapes and forms. Um, most often with the two lobes, sometimes you only see the one lobe, uh, and that's very asymmetric. Sometimes you see them like bent in, in half as if uh, they're swimming through something. Um, but there's a, a huge variety of these. And if we look in a little bit more detail, what's actually happening? So I said before, we don't fully understand the, the process that causes the, the jets to form at the black hole. It's something to do with the, the magnetic fields. Again, magnetic fields are always important. And the black hole itself, one of the characteristics is the spin. Um, and something here acts as a very strong particle accelerator, which shoots out these uh, charged particles that are created in the very uh, energized environment around the black holes. But we can do simulations once we assume that there's some uh, production of, of these uh, jets 
Uh, we assume certain physics about them, how strong they are, how much powerful, how powerful they are. Um, and we also assume that they live inside a galaxy and that galaxy lives inside a cluster. So clusters of galaxies also contain very uh, diffuse gas that's very, very hot. And this is gas that we see in the X-ray. Uh, and this is a computer simulation of one such jet that's launching into an intergalactic medium. So you can see the blue thing here is very kind of static at the beginning. Uh, and this jet turns on, color-coded in yellow that we see in the radio. Um, and what happens is as these jets propagate into the, the medium, they launch uh, shock waves. And you can see these shock waves quite strongly in the, the blue here, right up here. Shock waves very similar, like a, a bow shock forms in the front of the ship uh, passing through water. Um, and what's happening here, actually, these jets are transferring energy into this, this blue extra intergalactic medium um, and keeping it hot. When you give it more energy, you keep it hot. And this is a very important process because this blue medium is the raw material um, that if it became cool, it would fall onto the galaxy and be able to form new stars. Um, so it turns out that these black holes right at the centers of these galaxies are able to transfer their energy uh, into the environment around galaxies and um, prevent the formation of new stars. So the processes of star formation and the black holes are, are quite closely linked. We're still trying to understand exactly exactly how and so on, and that's, that's where we're looking for more of these black holes. Uh, we actually observe this, so this is real observations now compared to the simulations. Uh, and this is an image of the X-ray combined with the radio in the red at the bottom and in the contours here in the top uh, and the optical. So the optical is always a boring old uh, galaxy. Uh, and in the ray X-ray, actually, we see holes. We see these bubbles that have been filled out by the, the radio synchrotron jets that we see. So we see this actually happening in, in real sources, not just in, in our simulations. Uh, and this is a, I'll explain what's going on, what you're seeing on the screen here in a little more detail. This is a quite a complex simulation of a very large part of the universe. Um, put in some particles and then uh, let it run forward in time over billions of years, uh, assuming everything obeys the kind of physics that we know. So gravity attracts things. Um, and we also keep track of the, the temperatures of, of the gas. Um, because the important thing I said is that the, the gas needs to become cool in order to collapse and, and form stars. And if the gas is kept too hot, then it won't do this. So these simulations, actually, on the left here, you can see the matter. As time progresses, it slowly clumps down, forming quite dense parts right at the centers. And where these dense parts are forming, they're actually forming new galaxies. And those galaxies, new stars are forming and so on. Um, and in these simulations from the illustrious collaboration, they actually put in some kind of prescription that these stars, these galaxies will have a black hole and that'll produce jets. So on the right-hand side in the temperature map, you see things going, uh, things get a bit explosive at the beginning, at the, the, the intersections of these webs uh, and things get red. And this is exactly what's happening when the jets turn on in these galaxies from the black holes. They turn on, uh, provide energy into the medium uh, and make things hot. Um, and this is done in the, the simulations in a kind of tuned way. We know it should happen. We put it in uh, and we see effects of it. And then when we compare these simulations to actual observations of galaxies, because they tell us how many galaxies form, how big the galaxies are and so on. If you turn on this AGN feedback, these active galactic nuclei they're called, um, with the black holes are. If you turn this feedback on in the simulations, we get a much better match with the actual numbers and types of galaxies that we observe in the actual universe. So we know that it's really important, but some of the key questions is how much energy actually is there? How does this process actually um, play out? Because we can tune the simulations as much as we want um, without really understanding the details of it. Um, but in order to do that, uh, what we need to do is find lots of situations where we have the black holes and also where we have the, the star formation. 
So we can map out both the, the formation of stars and galaxies, and we can also map out the black holes, how many they are, how massive they are, um, how many of them have these jets, because we, don't, we know that it doesn't happen all the time. Uh, it also might depend on the type of black hole and so on. Um, and it turns out, as I mentioned, the radio is, is almost perfect for doing this because we see both the star formation um, and we see the, the black holes. Um, so before I go into a little bit more on that, I'm just going to go on a, a very quick whirlwind tour uh, of a large part of the world, uh, looking at a number of different uh, telescopes that we use. Uh, and you just heard the talk before me about the, the Green Bank Telescope. I'm not going to mention that um, because what I really focus on is using arrays of telescopes. So the Green Bank one is a, a single dish telescope, so it would be like this one, just one of these. Um, but we have some very clever techniques that allow us to take the data from multiple separate telescopes uh, and put them together in uh, computers uh, to turn that radiation that's received in these simple dishes um, into an actual image of the sky. So the Kolchijansky Very Large Array uh, is one of the earliest ones and it's been a very big workhorse of radio astronomy. It's done two very uh, famous, very large surveys of the sky, uh, which really helps us understand a lot about both black holes and, and star formation. It's in New Mexico, it's in the desert uh, in uh, the United States. Uh, completely switching continents, the Australia Telescope Compact Array, obviously in Australia, uh, is, as its name suggests, it's a fairly compact array. It only has six dishes, as you can see five of them in the single image. They're very closely uh, spaced together, uh, but it also operates at a quite high frequency. Uh, a completely different one is the Giant Meter Wave Radio Telescope. They have very original names in um, astronomy. This one works at meter wave. Uh, wavelengths. Uh, and the interesting thing here is you can see right through the, the dishes. And one would think, how does this even reflect any light? Um, but it turns out that um, the, the surface just needs to be as large, well, the surface needs to be smaller than the size of the, the radiation. So at meter wave radiation, your surface needs to be like centimeters apart in order to reflect the light. Uh, another very famous, uh, more recent one is the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, uh, situated high at high altitude in the Atacama Desert uh, in Chile. It's doing some spectacular, very high resolution, very detailed studies. Um, one of the, the more recent ones, uh, we already saw the, the image that comes from the Murchison Widefield Array um, at the start of this presentation. It looks quite different. It doesn't have these dishes. I'll come back to this in, in a moment. Um, one of the, the biggest future steps is the square kilometer array in radio astronomy that's going to be built soon. Uh, and there's two pathfinders, one in Australia, uh, the other one in South Africa, and both um, very good arrays in their own rights now. So this is ASCAP, uh, and this is the Meerkat array in, in South Africa. Um, but really what I, I want to focus on just in the, the final section of this talk is uh, the low frequency array. Uh, it's an interesting telescope. Uh, I like it because I work on it <laughs> um, and I have been working on it for some time. Um, like the Murchison Widefield Array, um, it looks quite different to the other ones that we saw. They're not simple dishes. In fact, they're even simpler than that. There are simple dipoles. Uh, things like this down here, or this one here that I'm standing next to. And you can see the size of the dipole is about the size of me, which means that the kind of light that it's detecting is of that size, so a few meters uh, in wavelength. Um, and LOFAR has thousands of these individual antennas. They're grouped together into these stations. Um, and in fact, this is a collection of a few stations. And these stations are situated mostly in the north of uh, the Netherlands, uh, but it has a few stations also in other European countries, uh, which enables it to look at very, very detailed, very sharp, high resolution um, images. Uh, yes, so that's LOFAR. Um, and all of the signals from these individual uh, antennas have to be put together in a supercomputer uh, to generate the kinds of images that we, we make. 
the interesting thing, again, contrasting this to the, the talk uh, about the Green Bank Observatory before this, is that it's built in the middle of Europe. Okay, it's a more, uh, less populated part of the Netherlands uh, up in the north, but it's still hugely populated. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of Wi-Fi, there's uh, wind farms that produce radiation. Um, and it's actually through more clever technology and advances that we're able to still use this telescope in this, this highly populated area. Um, so LOFAR is particularly good at covering large areas of the sky very, very quickly, but also making very detailed, so high resolution images um, that are also very sensitive. So we can see very faint objects. So this is just a single observation uh, of eight hours um, with the LOFAR telescope. And the area covered here is the details are 20 square degrees, but for comparison, the size of the moon would be about this big, probably about one, as big as one of these thumbnails here. Um, and this is full of sources. There's thousands of sources in a single image. And most of these are these double lobed radio galaxies. So these active galactic nuclei or black hole jets. Um, and some of them are also star forming galaxies. I don't have a good example here. There's one up here. Uh, so we're mapping both the, the black holes and the, and the star formation. So this is just a single observation. Uh, LOFAR will cover the entire northern sky with 3,000 of these observations. It's not so many when you think about it. Um, and one of the biggest projects on the LOFAR telescope is to do a survey of the sky. Um, and this is just a technical detail of areas that we covered and areas that we're still going to cover. So it's an ongoing survey, um, but it's really exciting. Uh, one thing, just sort of in the, the final minute here, um, Oh, before I go on, there's one, uh, a colleague of mine really likes to show this comparison. One of the, the biggest challenges is the sheer volume of data that we have to do with, deal with. So the entire survey to cover that whole sky, uh, if you were to put the raw data onto DVDs, uh, you'd need 37 stacks of DVDs as high as the Eiffel Tower. It doesn't really mean much, it's 48 petabytes of data. It's a lot of data, so we need supercomputers to, to process this data. Uh, and even moving around this volume of data uh, is, is challenging. The, the other challenge, as I've said, the radio is, is great for seeing both the star formation and the, the black holes, but we also want to know where they are, what kind of galaxies they live in, uh, are the galaxies forming stars, are the galaxies dead, um, and where they are, how distant they are in the universe. Um, so we have a big project to, to match the radio with the optical images. Um, in some cases, this is quite easy, and we use uh, lots of statistics to do this. There's a very rapidly growing area of um, machine learning or pattern recognition with artificial intelligence to do these kind of problems. Um, but it turns out that humans are also really good at doing this. So we have a project uh, called LOFAR Galaxy Zoo, uh, where we invite members of the public to help us uh, match the radio and the, the optical sources. And just to give you a flavor of some of the complexity of these sources, these are in the yellow, the radio sources, and in the background are optical images. Um, so we need to put all the pieces of the radio sources together uh, and then match them to optical sources, like in this case over here. Um, so with that information, with both the radio and the optical, we can build a map of these sources across uh, large parts of the universe uh, and really study these details of how the star formation and, and the black holes are, are connected to each other. Um, so I'm gonna end here uh, and just in the last, uh, while there's any questions or discussion or anything, I'm going to leave a a video playing uh, and this video just takes a, a map of uh, some of the LOFAR survey that we've already covered um, and puts it into three dimensions because we have this information of the distance from the, the optical sources. So I hope you can see this as we fly through the universe looking at uh, black holes and galaxies from LOFAR. So thank you.
so much, Wendy. That uh, that was a great presentation. I was wondering. Now we are we were uh, traveling through space a bit. Um, do you uh, come across black holes very often? Is is it a very yeah? Is it a very common thing you come across through the sky? Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, actually. And that's one of the um, topics of a, a recent science paper I was on. Um, so I make a great deal. We've got millions of new sources in these, these radio surveys. But if you look at optical surveys, there's some recent uh, uh, surveys, one's called PanStars, SDSS is an older one. Uh, they mostly look at just galaxies and the optical. Uh, and very often there's many, many, many more sources. So these particular jets of black holes are relatively rare. Um, I'll, I'll quantify that because I'll qualify that actually, because um, it depends on, on the kind of galaxy. So we know that in the most massive galaxies, uh, they almost always have one of these um, black holes that have the jets. Um, but of course, very, very massive galaxies are rare. Uh, you have many more small galaxies in the same way, many more uh, less energetic things. Um, so the black holes with the jets, we see very often in the most massive galaxies, but they're rare. Um, of course, we do think that every galaxy has at its center a black hole. So in that sense, they're everywhere, um, but they don't all have the radio jets that we observe. Thank you. Uh, and I think those uh, radio telescopic images, they, they look beautifully. They have uh, the high aesthetic value, I think. Uh, what do you think uh, art could could art play a role for your research or research in common astronomical research? Um, yes, that's a very good question about the the art itself. Um, I, I I took it out at some point. Uh, there was a great uh, illustration I had that's actually an artist uh, impression of a, of a black hole. So I think on the one hand, art helps us to illustrate some of the things we're looking at. Um, and one hand, radio astronomy, these what's on the screen now are some spectacular looking objects, but many of them are just blobs. So it kind of looks a bit boring. And even the uh, black hole image right at the beginning is just a, a ring, so it's kind of boring. Um, to really visualize the physics, I mean, it, it takes an understanding of the physics and then combining it with art to, to put it into something aesthetically pleasing. Uh, I think that can benefit us. Um, I also think, as you said, showing those images, even just if it's photos of the, the telescopes themselves, it's a, it's a great juxtaposition of both the technological uh, greatness of these, these instruments. I mean, just building these things, even like the Green Bank Telescope is a massive feat of engineering to build this huge searable dish. Uh, and even just taking taking photos of it in an artistic form just helps to highlight that. Uh, also making images like right at the beginning, these ones uh, in the background here um, makes, it's very artistic and it brings us a step closer bringing the radio, what we can't see with our eyes into something that we can actually visualize and appreciate uh, along with something that we see with our eyes uh, brings the two kind of closer together. I don't know if that makes sense. I think so. And I, I also think um, if, yeah, I think art can help us uh, make astronomy more appealing to the, to the public. And I think these yeah. uh, images can be, be a great, can be of great value for that. Yes. yes. Um, thank you so much, Wendy, for the great talk. Um, I hope in future we can learn more from you as, of course, uh, technology is improving and we maybe in the future we will be able to maybe visualize even more uh, unknown features from the sky, right? Yes, um, yeah, that's certainly true. Thank you so much. You. So um, after our second talk, uh, we are going to have a very short break of a quarter. So uh, we will be back at half past six uh, with the final presentation from uh, uh, with final presentation and we hope to welcome you back then. So see you in a bit all.
Okay, welcome back all. We just had a short break. Hope you had some time to grab a coffee or any other drink. Uh, and we will continue our program of today. Uh, we have been witnessing two great presentations about art and about astronomy. Uh, and now we are uh, going to, wait a sec, yeah. Uh, welcome back, and now we are going to lead on to the next presentation, and it's going to be our final presentation. Uh, and this presentation will focus on the future, uh, a concept uh, which many of us are dealing with, especially today with the constant threats and uncertainties. Uh, and today, author Scott Smith and curator Michelle Kaspersak will launch a, and discuss the new book, How to Future, Leading and sense making in an age of hyper change. Um, welcome, Scott and Michelle. Hi, Sana. Hello. Hi. Do you think now, with these uncertainties around COVID 19, uh, the book has become even more relevant than it already is? Absolutely, at least from our side. Um, it, it definitely has. We, we, we knew 2020 would be an interesting year. Um, but uh, we didn't know how interesting. So hopefully it's uh, going to be a great tool for people to uh, find their way forward out of the, the uncertainty that we have right now. Thank you. Do, do you actually have the book there already with you? We do. Here it is. It just book. arrived. Here it is. Fresh. Thank you. So <laughs> please enlighten us about this book. Yes. Well, thank you, Sana, for that great introduction. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Michelle Kasperzak, and I'm here with futurist Scott Smith today. And we're uh, launching How to Future, uh, his new book um, that he wrote in collaboration with Madeleine Ashby, and it's just released today on Kogan Page. And uh, we're going to just go through some of the, the some of the highlights and also discuss some of the main issues arising from uh, the book's uh, contents. But of course, I'm going to start by asking maybe one of the questions just to get us kicked off, the, the obvious question, of course, which is uh, how did it all get started? How did you get writing a book when, you know, your day-to-day -day futuring work was keeping you busy, but uh, you took the time out to, to produce this volume? Yeah, we had a couple of, um, a couple of, of things that came together for this. So um, first of all, um, you know, we, we had been teaching for about the past decade, um, myself and different colleagues, um, Madeline, Susan Cox Smith, my partner here at Changist, um, other folks that we've worked with around the world. And in the process of teaching futures to, um, I would say, non specialists uh, and doing that quite a lot over the period of a decade, um, we started to, to sort of find, I guess, a bit of a groove in terms of how to, how to make these sort of concepts and tools and methods that often seem a bit abstract to people who aren't familiar with them or maybe too complex from their perspective, um, how to actually bring those closer to people. And we sort of thought about it as, um, you know, meeting people where the future is for them and kind of creating a, a, a way of describing this work and also a kind of process that we use in our own work uh, that would be um, at least a kind of on-ramp. Um, there's always the option to kind of go deeper and, and go further into the literature or, you know, tap some other experts in this area, but we felt like people needed a kind of means of getting comfortable and getting into the topic. Uh, and we happened to, to be calling the workshops we were running How to Future, and that just seemed like a nice, concise title that cut straight to the point yeah. uh, for the book. Yeah, it's a great title. Yeah, yeah. Did you think, I mean, you've been in this business for something like 25 years or so. Um, did you ever have it uh, in your mind that you would essentially become a trainer and release a training tool like this book, which is a, at the core, there are all these exercises we can use? I think in a, I, I, the short answer is probably no, certainly initially. <laughs> um, I mean, I was, you know, like a lot of us, we're sort of so far into the work that we do and, and kind of focusing on that. And in this particular profession or kind of discipline, you get asked a lot of really diverse questions. So you're busy enough trying to kind of learn different fields, go deep in different topics. Um, but I also didn't necessarily sort of see myself or, uh, in a kind of instructional role. And it actually happened sort of by chance and being invited to set up a futures program for a summer school in the, U in the US uh, mm -hmm. for actually students coming into university. So we actually started with 16, 17 year olds 
which is a really interesting place to start because you're not, you know, normally in our work, we're working with 30, 40, 50 year old professionals and you're, you're unpacking and unwinding a lot of what they've learned throughout their life. And starting with someone who's younger, you're actually introducing a concept probably when it's most useful because they can use that to kind of cut their way through problems and try to parse complexity as they got older. Um, that led to other courses in other environments, teaching in Barcelona, really right after the Great Recession, um, in an environment where there were a lot of challenges, you know, amazing urban environment, and then more recently, the past three or four years in Dubai, which is a completely different setting. Um, so having those experiences of going through this material from very, very different perspectives, different cultures, different age groups, um, different kind of drivers for people being there, um, gave us a kind of, we stood back and realized that we had kind of attacked this problem from so many angles, that it was a good time to document it. Um, and also to kind of write the experience down from various perspectives, my perspective, Madeline's perspective, um, and come at it that way. So it came together. Yeah, nice. Um, I think related to that, something that might be interested to talk about now is um, you mentioned in the book a little bit about the perception of the field. Yeah. And you talk about how uh, advertising and pop culture uh, have really absorbed um, a kind of visual language of futurism mm -hmm. and of course also uh, used the term quite a lot, uh, yeah. bandied that around a lot. Um, and you also uh, note um, some uh, futurists, fellow futurists, if I can call them that, uh, who have coined terms like um, official futures mm -hmm. for the kind of cliched, uh, pull it off the shelf up here. Uh, yeah, flying car, that kind of thing, um, and used futures for a similar kind of the overused trope. Um, yeah, yeah. So we see a lot of that. There's this kind of that it's now become cliche. How how do you kind of navigate around those kinds of perceptions that are already, I guess, uh, influencing people and having them see what the tools can really do for them? It definitely is a kind of layer that you need to, I think you need to cut through first, because one of the things that people underestimate about this or sort of don't take into account is that you know, just sitting here, the two of us, if you asked us a kind of pop question of, you know, how we would define the future, we would have two probably very different answers that reflected not just kind of superficial issues around how far that is from now, um, but also kind of lived experience, the things that we aspire to, the things that we want in the world. There's probably a, you know, big overlap in the Venn diagram between us, but we're going to have different ways of perceiving it and different ways of kind of processing it. So, you know, a lot of books in this topic will start kind of taking you in, you know, straight into the kind of frameworks. And we felt like it was important to, to look at it critically um, and step back a couple of steps before we went into it to think about um, what are the, what's the kind of baggage, the cultural baggage that we carry around the future. And right now, I, I think I'd write about this in the forward to the book or the first chapter is that when we first started writing, there were so many messages around us in advertising. I walked through an H&M in Singapore and, you know, it felt like every other t-shirt had a kind of future slogan on it. Future is female. You're the future. I'm the future. The future is bright. And it's this thing that gets tossed around in culture, but we needed to kind of pin it down a little bit first before we could actually use it as a gateway into something else. Um, and so, you know, people do have wildly different perceptions about, you know, do we know things they don't? Do we predict things? The answer is no, shouldn't be. Um, do, you know, uh, are we um, pursuing a particular goal or aspiration ourselves? Do we want to advocate for flying cars and, you know, holograms or are there other futures that we might be um, in favor of ourselves? How does that, find itself into the work we do or not. So all of these things I think need to be kind of set out on the table first before we get past that. Yeah, there's also um, in, I think the similar section of the book, uh, you talk about um, a specific instance of how the terms you were using, the three Ps, mm -hmm. probable, possible, Plausible. Plausible. Uh, sorry. It's all right. Um, how those things didn't really translate very well into into Arabic when you were working uh, in Dubai and you were tr you were working in an intercultural context and trying to think of um, yeah how do you express things in other languages what is and language of course reveals a lot about culture so absolutely um, maybe it's an interesting moment also to talk about how um, intercultural working and how diverse teams help us 
uh, come up with different non-cliched futures? Yeah, no, so I think, I mean, that's a, there's a lot packed into that question. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so just to kind of pick it apart a little bit, I think to kind of take the first part, um, you know, there's even, so you reference these three terms, possible, plausible, and probable. And those come from um, a structure that gets used a lot in futures called the futures cone, which is a, a kind of visual metaphor for thinking about, you know, back to some of the astronomy discussion, the way that light travels through space, you know, it, it fades out over time. Um, and you can think of the things that are directly in front of us as being probable, that we can see linearly ahead of us, the things that may be slightly off to the side that we're not sure about as being plausible and everything else that's not impossible is possible. You and I can probably agree on those definitions because we come from roughly the same culture, but um, plausible is a very soft word that can mean a lot of things. Possible can mean completely different things to people. Probability implies a kind of you know quantitative measure. And um, there are great discussions just within the kind of um, I guess, core of the futures community about what plausibility means um, and who, who's plausible are we talking about and wh what's behind that plausibility. Um, but when you then take it to other cultures, you know, we've had these experiences around the world and, and working with great groups from very different backgrounds that um, we can't just assume those words will translate smoothly into another language and mean the same thing. And when we're talking about abstractions in the future, things that are uncertain, that can mean quite different things. So uh, in the Arabic example we talk about in the book, the distinctions around plausibility and what is, what is probable uh, are informed quite heavily by um, culture, you know, both in the kind of immediate sense, culture in the deeper sense. Um, and, you know, what is probable may be something that was laid out ahead of time that we're fulfilling versus um, something that we may want as individuals. So, um, and we may take certain things as kind of preordained. There are plenty of people in the Western you know, sphere who take everything from Elon Musk's mouth as being um, probable. When we know that he's actually talking in plausibilities, trying to move it towards probable. Exactly, yeah. So these kind of word tangles, you know, really have to, again, they need to be kind of smoothed out a little bit so we can understand whether we have the same perception of something that we're then negotiating around and trying to create together. Are we even talking about meters and feet? You know, those kinds of differences. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think around this idea of also there's a, again, you mentioned the the collectively creating futures and how that can be done and the importance of getting uh, groups together who can yeah. bring different things to the table and vocabulary feeds into all of that as well. Um, and at one point you say, we are all futurists now. And, uh, and I think that's a really, uh, that really ties in nicely to a thread throughout the yeah. book that uh, talks about, I'm gonna mention it, active noticing, um, this uh, concept that you, that you raised that futuring is not something you do once as a one and done task or or even as something that uh, happens by a particular person in a particular department of your company, yeah. but something that everyone should take on board personally. And it's part of your everyday that you're, you're actively noticing things. That's how you can spot trends, et cetera. Do you wanna maybe talk a little bit more about how you try to embed this as a more everyday practice? Yeah, I think I mean, one of the reasons we, you know, people will sort of chuckle a little bit when they see future being used as a verb, not a noun. And um, that was done intentionally in part because we were, we were trying to express this idea of um, this is not just a kind of function or a business, but a capability and actually a behavior. And for some of us who've done it for a long time and kind of, you know, we're quite immersed in it day to day, literally from the time we wake up to go to sleep, um, that just, it becomes an embedded behavior. And I think that's quite important when we think about, um, you know, explaining to people how this shouldn't just be a kind of function you turn on and off, but really becomes part of our everyday approach. Um, it's great to have specialists and experts, um, uh, you know, often one sector or, in a, you know, who kind of go to people in the corner of a company. But really this, if it's only left as that, people see it as being somebody else's problem. You know, it's the Douglas Adams, someone else's problem field. <laughs> Um, and that if it's someone else's problem, they'll solve it for me and I'll just wait here. 
And if you look around, we've been waiting for someone else to solve the problems of our future for quite a while. There are a lot of people working very hard on trying to make things better, but it's something that everybody can be engaged in. So, you know, coronavirus, we've seen bottom up work done on that that's actually complementing the expert work at the top. Um, energy transition, food transition, education, uh, healthcare, we go down the list, all of these transitions can't be left only to um, consultants and experts. They need to be something that people are engaged with and um, sensing on their own. So this active sensing idea is basically being aware of things that are around you already, but you hadn't been focusing on them. And you know, if I ask anybody you run into on the street, what's the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning? You know, they reach for their phone, they start scrolling and looking at um, their newsfeed. That's partly because they're doing a kind of horizon scan of what's been happening while they're asleep. Is the world still there? What are the issues I need to deal with? What new risks have emerged this morning? What's on fire? What's not on fire? Um, I mean, these are the kind of tragic realities of everything right now. Why is my feed orange all of a sudden? <laughs> right, right. And yeah. so you're finding out that there's this crisis happening in another part of the world. How is that going to affect me? Mm -hmm. um, what can I do for it? Yeah. Is most people's kind of response, you know, is the R number uh, higher locally for COVID right now? But, you know, also as a new product come out, when I get to the office or when I get to my kitchen table and open my laptop, am I going to be dealing with a new competitor? Um, is there a sort of social change happening that I should be aware of? Because we've seen really critical change happening this year as well. Black Lives Matter, um, you know, it emerged and kind of grew just as COVID has kind of come from another part of the world. They're by no means anything similar, but they're emergent phenomenon mm -hmm. that you were seeing already and knowing about them, but you hadn't had a framework to kind of put them in and a thing to call them and a way to track them to understand how they would affect your future and how you might react or respond or anticipate in relation to that. Yeah, and related to that, I think it's interesting, something um, I think we had a conversation about before where we were discussing protest and kind of the yeah. way that that activates people and engages people. It gets them involved in local or even international issues. Um, but it's, it's one way of interacting with a problem space or it's one way of addressing an issue and that by giving the tools that you've given in this book, you're enabling people to go beyond saying, no, this is, you know, this is wrong, we don't want this, and going towards saying, this is what, you know, no, right. and this is what we want. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, right, I think that's, you know, there's a, there's a phrase that always kind of loops in my mind, it's like, it takes a future to fight a future. And I think that's, that's been really relevant when you see, you know, if you, don't, if you don't like the things that are being done in your name, or even not in your name, worse, um, or being done kind of that you might benefit from later on, but you haven't had a voice in that. Um, you know, how do you, how do you actually kind of counter present or, you know, co-analyze the situation so that you can bring something back to the table? Um, you know, this came up, for example, in work that we were doing around the Museum of the Future in Dubai a few years ago. And they were using that kind of temporary exhibition as a way of exploring one in one of the years exploring AI. And they, you know, it was set up in a kind of dialogic fashion, which was really useful because AI is going to change all of our lives, um, regardless of how it, it falls or kind of manifests. But how often do we get to understand it and kind of articulate our own view of where it should be in our life? And that can best be done by, you know, kind of painting a picture or a, describing a scenario that you find preferable um, and also plausible <laughs> um, that you can then kind of prototype or describe or tell a story about in a way that communicates your preferred future to someone else. That sounds like a long way of explaining it, but frankly, it's just kind of giving you the tools to express the future you prefer or the future that provides more opportunity and less risk. And that's the same basic set of tools that we're using to work out more complex questions or seemingly complex questions of, you know, high technology and science or social policy or economics. Um, so it's bringing those kind of, again, kind of bringing the tools to people where they see the future and helping them do something with it. I think that's, again, to go back to the perception of the field, 
it's perceived as something that uh, it's beyond what you know mm. me as as a you know uh, Jane Doe uh, whoever can do you know right, and right, right. it's a uh, Jane on the block whatever uh, my name is and it's you know uh, instead you're providing a very accessible toolkit um, for you know, this is not the domain of Unilever and Coca-Cola. This is, yeah. you know, well, it is, and it is, and it yeah. is used by them regularly to, to plan, uh, you know, future products, to yeah. scope out markets, to do all kinds of things. Um, but your point very, that comes across very strongly in the book is that uh, futuring is not something that is also done to you. You can do it as right. well. Um, so this, in this sense, you can have a kind of competing uh, visions that, uh, that can then be, out and aired in the public. Yeah, I mean, and this is it's it's not a new thing in the sense that there's been a um, there's been a kind of current of democratization happening in the futures field now for quite a while, mm -hmm. um, and some of my colleagues and, and kind of professional peers of ours who are, you know, the most advanced or kind of accomplished in terms of their research and work, you know, over decades of being in the field, have also been moving, you know, kind of moving in this direction and participating in it as well because. You know, many of us recognize the stakes are quite high, and every, you know this is going to take more than just a few of us in the corner. There's a futures literacy movement going on that's that's headed in a lot of the same direction, and um, you know it's trying to kind of demagic it. And I think in part because people have this perception that it is an expert field, and yes, it is, and um, you know at certain levels, but also it's a great way to help people work with us. You know, if we're working with an organization or a business or a government or a community group, all of which we've done in this past year, um, if we give them the tools and language to express themselves in a way that we can talk back to them, then that project becomes richer. The, you know, we can, we can leverage knowledge they don't have or, you know, other comparative experiences or tools that they aren't familiar with more easily if they're um, at least already kind of up on that first step or first rung on the ladder. And it's uh, that's probably not a great metaphor because it's not a hierarchy, um, but it is a, you know, it's kind of giving this tools to meet each other in the middle. Yeah, and I guess that's maybe that's something we can talk about a little bit more because um, well, we've hardly touched even all, all the tools that are in the book. It's really chock-a-block full of uh, tools that people can use. Yeah, and yeah. there's on the website for the book, people can also download worksheets to, yeah. to do stuff. So, I mean, you've really provided a complete uh, toolkit. Um, so let's say I'm your client and, you know, uh, I call you up and I say, okay, and, you know, I read your book and I followed, right. followed some of the stuff that you suggested and we did uh, one of the canvases that you provided and, you know, we, and then we got a little stuck. So yeah. you're envisioning that this also enables the conversation to go to a higher level, I suppose, with people. Yeah, exactly. The, um, I mean, we've, as I said, we've taught a lot of kind of workshops and, and capacity building exercises to get people um, teams basically talking to each other, you know, mm -hmm. where two colleagues in a big company or big organization can pass in the hallway and be having the same conversation about the future or whatever their question is. But it also allows both, I think for both sides, both of us to kind of cut to the, the core of the issue more, a little more quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do we really want to get down into the choice of scenario forms if we're going to use them and tell, to tell the story in the right way? for us, um, uh, for example, or how do we want to kind of precede the research so we're actually running when we hit the, the exploration and not just having to gather things from scratch. And that I think makes a tremendous difference because as with anything, you know, an educated um, user or educated citizen or whatever, you know, is, is in a much better place to be clear about what they want to achieve. And you know, from, from 20 plus years of working in the kind of consulting field, that cuts a lot of, you know, miscommunication out of the way in theory and gets us to kind of work on the heart of the question and actually, frankly, do some more interesting stuff, both, you know, both parties and that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, uh, in terms of the, the uses of this book and the various ways that people can um, implement it, uh, another aspect that, that came up several times was leadership. Yeah. And I think this is also something, so it's, of course, uh, these tools could could be and are probably, well, very well suited to collective use, yeah. uh, to imagine collective futures. 
but for people who are looking to become uh, to step more into a leadership role, let's say, yeah. um, it also provides them with some unique opportunities. Do you see any particular tools in the book that might help somebody uh, develop into a stronger uh, leader? It's a, that's an interesting question, and it's one where you know I always sort of think of leadership as being very much a kind of management businessy issue, but um, you know so much in this area the leadership is situational. You know, it's kind of people either leading from the side or leading from behind by by getting out of the way and letting other people do their work. And, um, you know, in some cases, it's being able to communicate more clearly. You know, if you're it's one thing to kind of, you know, be a leader and kind of play that role of imposing a future vision on your team. Mm. Um, and then you've kind of put them back in the same you know situation of having to execute your idea. But being able to give people language and tools to use to express what they collectively want. What does the organization think is the best thing here? What do people who work on the front lines see as being the most, you know, pressing emerging issues, the risks or opportunities, etc. Um, to me, that's much better in terms of leadership in the sense that it's, it's um, empowering, you know, which is such a kind of sticky word, but it's giving people the kind of capability to say what they need and point to risks that you may not see or point to opportunities you may not see, make connections between um, emerging trends from very different areas um, that they can see coming and kind of, you know, you are a hockey person, like being able to <laughs> skate to where the puck is going, right? Yeah, yeah. To use an unfortunate sports metaphor. <laughs> um, and so I feel like it, it enables people to lead by stepping out of the way and connecting teams, back to your earlier question around kind of desirable characteristics, connecting diverse teams with different experiences and giving them a, a landscape, a canvas, a table, whatever, mm -hmm. and language to express their ideas about the future more clearly. Mm -hmm. um, I think also uh, it's interesting, as you were talking, I was thinking about how this is used in maybe different fields. Yeah. So um, we're tonight in a very kind of science-based uh, program mm -hmm. and we heard some great talks uh, earlier that are very science related. And I think, um, uh, do you encounter resistance? I kind of got a little kind of uh, caricature, caricature in my mind of the skeptical scientist going, I don't know about this scenario stuff. You know, I mean, I'm sure there's, but I'm sure there's not, that's not fair, maybe. Don't, don't, be, upset. <laughs> don't be upset with me, scientists. Scientists, You're she's, skeptical right. and that's great. Um, but, you know, there, I'm sure there's some fields that are way more receptive than others. And the arts and culture field, as you noted in the book, is quite warm and welcoming of the, the futurist yeah. perspective. But I mean, maybe we can talk a little bit more about where you think this fits or could could overcome some resistance. You've got me in a corner. I have to come back out. Of. Um, <laughs> no, it's a, so I think one of the things you're kind of getting at is, for example, we've had this experience a lot, is that people who come from different fields and different backgrounds with certain training um, kind of embed and embody mm -hmm. certain ways of thinking about problems. So if you have people who are coming, say, from an engineering field or law or um, the sciences where there is a, there's a scientific method, there's yeah. perhaps a linear process of, of problem solving that if you have input A and input B, you know, the answer may be C. And those can be challenging conversations because we're getting out of linear processing linear thinking in this. We're actually back to that cone idea. You're kind of opening up the aperture to take in things that may seem disconnected and peripherally, you know, unrelated that um, can be initially challenging for some people who are coming with a more um, kind of algorithmic or sort of processing mindset. Whereas people who come from the arts, et cetera, you know, or social fields may have experience already and thinking a bit more kind of tangentially. And um, so putting those those kind of elements together and finding a space where both of those groups can communicate is, um, you know, challenging, but that's where kind of establishing common language and giving people a way to step away from their common ways of thinking can, can be a little bit more free and bring them onto a kind of common um yeah common terrain yeah 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 and i think uh the book is uh to go back to the to the <laughs> tone of the book again which i found so so interesting um uh is is hopeful ultimately and i think that's i mean you do mention at one point that you've noticed the tone has gotten dark in the past yeah, yeah. in the past few years and you talk about uh particularly bookending uh 
the book with trips to Singapore and, and you know, the difference in tone and how the world is changing quickly. But uh, I think there's a lot of hope in the book. Is that kind of a like a, a naive reading or a, hope, a hopeful reading of hope in, in the, the futurist practice? Well, I think, you know, for a lot of people, the you know, hope is the end point for this, right? Mm. And that you, you're, you're aspiring to create something that's better than the situation we have now. And you go to the future to figure out how to change path today. Mm. Um, you know, I, as a, as a practitioner, can often kind of be more comfortable looking both at the positives and negatives um, and being a bit more neutral and stepping back and kind of, um, you know, making sure I'm not obscuring the difficult stuff out of hope. But, you know, ultimately, you're not doing this to hurt people, you're doing this to kind of help whoever you're, you're representing. Um, and there's a great quote we end with, it's um, Dr. Genevieve Bell, who's a uh, anthropologist, worked at Intel, is an Australia at 3A Institute now. Um, and, you know, I've always sort of seen her work as being very aspirational for us, because she's able to bring a kind of um, rational hopefulness to it. And I think she says something like, you know, if you see a better future, you have a, a moral responsibility to create it. And I think that's a, a very powerful um, idea to follow. That isn't just, you know, necessarily trying to kind of make everything sunny and bright and utopian. Mm -hmm. It's certainly not just for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think you have to be looking to avoid the difficulties and, you know, optimize for the better outcomes here. Yeah. You also have a nice uh, quote at the end mm. that I'm going to read, if that's all right, uh, about leadership and uh, saying that leadership in a futuring context is less about setting a vision for others to execute, disrupting industries, scaling startups, or valorizing entrepreneurship for its own sake, that is generating wealth through so-called innovation, and more about using an informed applied approach to finding a complex path towards inclusive, collectively preferred futures and guiding others along that path. And I think that's very beautifully for me, uh, kind of captured um, for me what I felt it was a kind of sustaining aim throughout the book. Mm -hmm. uh, this kind of idea of responsibility, as you just said, um, or as uh, Genevieve Bell says, uh, if you see a better world, you're more morally obligated to go and make it happen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I th yeah, so this is the kind of, you know, we've been talking about science tonight, you know, this is, you know, I think the aim is discovery, but sort of science for improvement, science mm -hmm. for sort of bettering things. Mm -hmm. But I think that responsibility part is really critical because it, it's, it is important to kind of do some things that sometimes aren't done in kind of popular futurism, which is, um, you know, stepping back to ask whose world is this that we're, that we're shaping? Who do we have responsibility for? Who are we speaking for? Who's not being spoken for here in this conversation? And those kinds of, you know, that kind of critical awareness should hopefully, <laughs> to use that term again, mm -hmm. um, give people a, a better steer yeah. in what, what they're after and not just kind of, you know, aiming for a cool technology or, a, a, you know, an interesting business model, but doing something that improves things. Yeah, and I think that's, that's what makes the book, I mean, which, which could have very easily been um, a simple collection of tools, um, yeah. You know, I mean, that, that would have been the, the easy way to write this book, actually, uh, you know, to just now kind of, know. Now you know. <laughs> it's just kind of uh, without any of the context that, that gives it kind of more of a grounding, because yeah, um, yeah. you include a lot about that, but uh, the work, you credit a lot the work of other futurists as well and their terminologies. Absolutely, and yeah. yeah, so I think that's, uh, but the undercurrent of like a moral responsibility is something that grounds it and makes it not so, yeah, just floating in a you know, in a spreadsheet somewhere. Yeah, and I, th I think that, again, is important. And it's, you know, it's what I sort of see as being the intent behind most of the people that we, you know, that we cite in there. I mean, the mm -hmm. book, I kind of think of the book as kind of a, um, a kind of central pivot point, mm -hmm. you know, the, a lot of that information kind of floats around that people can go and look it up. As you said, we've put the kind of bibliography on the website mm -hmm. on howtofuture.com. And you can, you know, go there in part because we're always discovering new tools, people who have come from outside the field who are writing things that are, you know, incredibly perceptive and eloquent. We want to plug those in. Mm -hmm. There's so many new people coming into this field of practice from the outside um, mm -hmm. or from who are emerging from inside the field mm -hmm. to have a better, stronger voice. Um, and so, I, you know, we think of the book as kind of something that other things get kind of tacked on to um, more than it kind of being you know, the definitive word, do it this way or no other way. You know, it's 
use this to get you where you, you need to get. And if you find other, other tools, let us know. You yeah. Know. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, this is a great document and that's something that's, uh, that will, you know, will travel and, you know, be on, be on people's bookshelves. <laughs> um, but yeah, the companion website is great for allowing people to, you know, plug into some of the sources and also, yeah, yeah download the sheets. And there's also the cards that maybe you want to mention. Oh yeah. So the, <laughs> We, you know, we've used a couple of different kind of, I guess, working tools or metaphors over time. You know, everyone thinks of like workshops being full of post-its mm -hmm. um, and uh, our, our friend- a stereotype. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So it was like an attempt to see how many stereotypes we could break. Um, we've worked with our, our friend and colleague, John Wilshire uh, at Smithery in London, um, which developed a thing called Artifact Cards. And, um, you know, there are a different way of kind of thinking and working with information and ideas, but the beauty of them are is that you're, you know, whereas post-its kind of seem stuck and final, mm -hmm. um, cards are something we know how to shuffle, deal, mm -hmm. interchange, exchange mm -hmm. ideas, combine. So they became a great kind of, um, you know, kind of kinesthetic tool or, or kind of metaphor for working. And we've always used blanks to work and color code things in the workshops. Uh, and a few weeks ago, we stepped back and thought, you know, we're actually talking about this way of doing things in the book. Maybe we should go one step further. So we actually made a set of limited kind of run artifact cards mm -hmm. that are how to future cards that have um, the five kind of steep categories, social, technological, environmental, economic, and political, which everybody has a different system, but that's the core. Um, and then we leave a little blank to kind of define what horizon something's happening on. So teams can get together, write down different trends or ideas that they have about the future that fall in those categories. And even by saying, this is a social trend that is happening on a long time horizon, you've already taken an idea or an insight, sorted it by two different kind of criteria mm -hmm. and moved it somewhere. So the next idea, the next idea that, that meet, um, you start to see a picture emerging of a future that you're kind of mm -hmm. co-writing. Mm -hmm. So those are actually, I think, out of the print shop today or the printers today and it's starting to be available. And yeah, they, they make a nice compliment, I think, to the yeah. book so you can get comfortable with expressing those ideas. Mm. Yeah, and I think as on the whole, the, the book does uh, is a really nice, gentle, comfortable way for people to, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean that as a compliment, a nice, gentle, yeah, comfortable yeah. way to for people to get acquainted with it without feeling intimidated by any kind of, um, yeah, corporate speak or anything, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's very accessible yeah. and, uh, and clear. Well, and my, I guess another critical piece in there is like, my name's not the only name on the cover. You yeah. Know, Madeline Ashby um, wrote part of it and basically brought her experiences into mm. it. So it kind of hopefully role models a bit that idea of um, different voices kind of being at the table. Um, my colleague, Susan Cox Smith, did a brilliant job of editing it and, yeah. and uh, in advance of our brilliant editors at the publisher. Um, so there are a lot of hands in there kind of working on yeah. it, but also um, talking about some similar issues from different different perspectives as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, Madeline has different experiences than I do. She's asked to do different things. She's a novelist and writer, yeah. as well as being a, a credentialed futurist from OCAD in, in uh, Toronto. Yeah. Um, she brings the academic, you know, perspective as well. Yeah. So many different kind of angles coming in, but you know, it was important that we that we fuse that kind of in the work itself as well. Mm -hmm. So you have this uh, well balanced, <laughs> um, hopeful set of tools that you've put out in the world, and a couple of years from now, you open your email and you get the best fan mail you've ever got, and it tells you how they use those tools to do something fantastic, what would that kind of thing be? Ooh, that's a big question. <laughs> yeah, I decided to throw you a really Thank tough you. one. <laughs> um, we're talking about sports instead. Yes, yes. Um, no, I think that's a really tough question. I think that's like, that's the dream kind of outcome. Yeah, right. Um, you know, we, we already, I think one of the things that kind of keeps us going is people who come up to us now and talk about mm. some of the work we've done. Um, we, uh, Susan and some of our other colleagues just finished a great workshop um, for International Women's Development Agency in Australia, uh, looking at feminist futures mm. and being able to use those tools to kind of, you know, punch holes in these barriers, I think is quite, quite useful. So those kinds of things, I think, where you've actually got kind of groups that can 
um, you know, find better futures for themselves. Um, you know, major problems. I know I'm kind of generalizing, but there's so many things to kind of choose from. Too many. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, I think changing minds is a really important part. You know, people yeah. who are, are fixing or are approaching major issues that we face. Um, you know, we work with different community groups around the world and so many things are going on between the community action group and the grassroots that yeah. need to be dealt with. I think, you know, it, yeah, it would be nice to see that someone's figured out how to get water from Mars or whatever, but I actually would like to see um, a, a kind of infrastructural block, you know, removed somewhere mm. that that is a kind of leverage point. And I think one of the nice things about this work is if you find kind of interesting critical leverage points deep down in problems and try to kind of lift those with these tools, this actually can be quite powerful versus making one more better thing that we already have. Um, and so I think it would be something like that, you know, where someone's actually kind of picked a lock that's been troubling us for a long time. Or to enable a conversation that has never been able to happen before, but yeah, around the neutrality of one of these worksheets or some of this, these kinds of tools that enable conversations. And the, you know, the people who created this field originally, you know, in the fifties, sixties, seventies, and even earlier, you know, meant for it to be a way of centering conversations that were really difficult to have. Mm. We think about the outcome as being, um, you know, oh, we got a cool scenario out of this project or look at this great piece of speculative design that's come from it. The, we talk to people about this a lot. The, you know, pay attention and listen to the conversations that are happening earlier because mm -hmm. that's where the value is being exchanged. That's where the heat's actually happening. And, um, you know, the, the people who kind of created modern scenario planning talked about it as, yeah. um, uh, you know, a tool for a sandbox for disagreement, a way to get people out of their offices and out of their divisions <laughs> talking about things. And they've been yeah. used to, you know, deal with political, deep entrenched political problems, et cetera. So mm -hmm. yeah, kind of convening, convening difficult conversations yeah. and finding a kind of agreeable vision forward, I think is probably the best outcome. Yeah. Well, I'm curious if there are any questions out in the out in the world. Thank you, thank you, Michelle and Scott, for this great talk. Uh, well, uh, I have a question for you. Um, so, Scott, you were talking about that the toolkit and book and the workshops you have been giving can help uh, diverse teams talking about the future together. Mm -hmm. uh, and talking about diversity, when you look at the working environment, you often see different generations of people working yeah. together uh, and different generations also address challenges in a different way. So I was wondering while compiling this toolkit, did you have a specific generation in mind? We did not, but we did have the kind of the, the cross-generational question in mind. So for example, um, you know, I'm probably a little older than you. And so my idea about what the future is from a kind of practical civilian point of view is different than yours or my, my son or daughter um, or your daughter. You know, they're, they're, those time horizons are very different. And so finding ways to kind of strip out and kind of neutralize those, um, uh, you know, the kind of built-in assumptions is really important because it allows us to kind of again, negotiate both from our own kind of social, cultural, gender, generational points of view, what we see the kind of critical issues as being. Um, you know, I, I, I'd like to think it's kind of a very accessible for younger people. Again, you know, we started out talking about teaching the 16, 17 year olds. Um, I think it's, you know, there's a, there's a push to try to get this kind of education into um, secondary schools you know, not even university yet, but, but go younger. So if you, you can imagine, you know, you've come out of university, if you went in to university with some of these kind of ideas and terms and definitions in mind, how different you might have approached things. You may still be in the same field, but you might have seen your future pathways being different. Um, and lots, you know, you could have gotten together with other people to, to make change in different ways. So I think, again, back to that leverage point, going younger <laughs> and going more diverse, looking for neurodiversity, you know, um, social cultural diversity, all those sorts of things, get us down into those leverage points that can help us 
speak more clearly about what we find to be desirable in the future. Yes, I agree that, and that, that you created a toolkit for this. It's great. Um, I have one other question and okay. something that I found very interesting. You said that the book was co-written with science fiction writer Madeline Ashby. So I was wondering uh, how did science fiction fit in your book? So it's a really interesting question because really some of our work can veer into those fields, um, but uh, in, you know, and can, it also kind of informs people's perceptions of what futures may be possible. Um, so it has a really interesting relationship and you know, Madeline can speak to this much better directly, but and she's written and talked a lot about it, this, um, the, the, the way that you can tell stories and the way you build worlds can be quite similar. Um, sometimes like I, I actually think the tools from this field help science fiction writers be better world builders because it creates a bit of scaffolding and structure that might otherwise have to kind of be invented. Um, but it also, again, tells us about, we were talking about this earlier today, the, the kind of power dynamics that get expressed in popular science fiction. Um, science fiction is a really interesting mirror for expressing our fears about the world. There's a lot of that right now. Black Mirror you know, <laughs> didn't get there by accident. You know, that it's, um, we talk about problems in science fiction because it removes it from us. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, you were saying earlier, it's like science fiction is also a place where we might imagine traveling to another galaxy, but um, women don't have power. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, <laughs> they never saw feminism coming. <laughs> so all of these kind of weird imbalances, it's a great kind of canvas that we can express things on and then go, wait a minute, actually. Wait a minute. This is, you know, we, we need to think about the way these things relate to each other. Um, so it's both a, a kind of common language that we can speak in um, that can you know, talk to average everyday people in a way, but it's also a kind of tide we have to swim against because it's everyone's perception of the future comes from you know, either uh, a mixture of what they were told as children, the books and TV shows and films they watched, mm -hmm. or you know, the expert that they're investing in today. So it's, it's both a, a, it's a double, double edged sword, I think. Thank you. And um, well, also very important, where can people buy the book? So um, we said it's actually today's launch day, which is very exciting. It, it was delayed slightly because of COVID, but we made it to this future. <laughs> um, you can buy it um, through most online booksellers, um, the ones that you tend to favor, uh, the, the Amazons and BOL here in the Netherlands Bowl um, carries it, ABC in the Netherlands. Um, but if you go to... Um, uh, howtofuture.com, we actually list everyone that we know right now that's carrying it or directly through our publisher, koganpage.com in London. And literally just 10 minutes before we went on, we had a box of books arrive at the front door. So they are real and in the world. Hot and fresh. Great, thank you so much. I'd like to thank the both of you for this great presentation. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. So we reached the end of the program of the first event day from the Ars Electronica Festival 2020. Thanks to all the speakers who enlightened us with their great contributions. I would also like to thank all of you who tuned into our program. If you like this, we have another evening tomorrow with another presentation by photographers Andrew and Paul, and we will have a panel discussion on the powers of 10. And on Saturday, we will have a full day of moon gallery, uh, and they will talk about how to send an art piece to the moon. That's actually their plan, so that's what we're going to talk about on Sunday, uh, Saturday, sorry. And Sunday, we will finally open our visitor center again. And we are very much looking forward to welcome you all again in Leiden. Dear all, have a great evening and see you soon. <laughs>